So we're very excited to be here today to really celebrate the research that the high school students have done um, this summer with our group. And um, as many of you know, um, we have been the Women's Cancer Research Center site um, for the Hillman Academy this year. I really have a lot of thank yous to, um, to say this morning, but I wanted to start with a little introduction to who I am um, and what, what we did today. So I was actually once a high school uh, a researcher um, in, a, in a summer program much like this one. Um, and, and, and as of today, I'm the uh, research associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh and also um, at the Institute of Precision Medicine, as well as the breast cancer program here. Uh, my summer um, research program as a high school was at the Bagram Institute in Cambridge. I used to say that my building was, I can't really see the top of it, it's much more beautiful than Hillman Cancer Center, but now we're in this new building, I think this is very perfect too, so I can't really say that anymore. But it was an experience that really made me excited about science and, and asking questions, and I hope that the summer program has had the same effect on, on some of the students here today. After, after uh, doing an undergraduate degree at the University of Newcastle in pharmacology, which is drug action, how the body um, changes drugs and what drugs do to the body, I went to graduate school at the University of Bradford um, in England, probably helping my accent. Uh, we have really cool, bright colored graduation folks, so nice plug there for, for going to graduate school in England. Um, and I had three major advisors, and as well as learning how to be a scientist and how to ask research questions, um, I really learned the Ooh, folks online, if you could mute, that would be great, please. Um, I really learned um, that it, perseverance is a key to being a successful scientist. And I also learned some people management. We're all smiling in this picture. It's my graduation day. It was a great occasion. But my three advisors didn't always see eye to eye. In fact, very infrequently saw eye to eye. So I had to get adept in kind of managing them as well as managing my research projects. From there, I was a postdoc at St. Jude Research Hospital in Memphis. Um, and my advisor here, Richard Gilbertson, uh, who's at the left of the picture, um, where we worked on uh, childhood brain tumors. And I think at St. Jude, I really learned to, to dream big and to work hard, play hard. When I first got to St. Jude, they told me that one of the biggest limitations was your own ideas. And I think that was an institution where that's certainly true. And I think that there's many academic institutions in the US and around the world where, where that is the case. Um, and then, of course, you need to work hard to be successful in your career, but you also need to work hard outside of, of your career with your families and your friends, making memories and really have, becoming a well-rounded person and enjoying all aspects of life. I then went to Eli Lilly Company, where as a research group leader, um, first in oncology and then in toxicology. And this was my advisor, um, Anya Stauber, who really taught me um, to have confidence in what you're doing, even if it's something new. You know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to do something that you don't feel that comfortable with, because the more you do, the more you will learn. Um, and it, people, you can build respect um, from people while you're building your knowledge. You don't have to be the biggest expert for people to be able to respect your contribution. You can start, start small. And as you, um, you know, you improve in your knowledge and in your experience, um, that respect will build as well. And then now at, in Pittsburgh, I work very closely with Adrian Lee and Stephanie Utrecht, and we'll hear from a couple of students that have worked in their lab this summer. And I think some of the biggest lessons they've taught me is to do something that you're really passionate about and listen to those around you, right? Be that people who are um, you know, higher up in the organization than you, they may, be, they may be junior trainees, they might be your high school students, you know, everything, everyone has something to offer. So today is gonna be a celebration of the research that the students um, here today have done this summer, um, and also, um, you know, a celebration of building mentor and mentee relationships, which I think we have started this summer with our high school students. And we really encourage them to stay in touch with us, keep us, keep us posted on what your next steps are. Maybe there's an opportunity to come back and do more research with us. We hope that we started a, a relationship that will last a long time. So I won't take too much longer, but I want to run through some really key thank yous. So um, we have lots of people that have been involved in our mentoring team this summer. Yes, I was on my way back from Chicago. Quit missing. And my family was looking everywhere for me. I have the power to meet people. I've realized that that's good. Um, so we have, uh, these are the, the principal investigators for the labs that our high school students have worked in this summer. So big thanks to you for welcoming the students into your lab this summer, providing the resources uh, to do their research. I, and I'm sure. You're already nervous for this weekend. And, and I, 
They keep on muting. I'm not sure who that is. So hopefully that will stop. Please, guys online, please stay muted. Um, so big, big thanks to the principal investigators. And then the trainee mentors from our, from our group. These are the folks that have really worked one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with our, with our trainees this summer and really provided them guidance and mentorship, taught them experiments, explained their projects. So huge thanks to you. You've probably made the biggest time investment in the students this summer. So great, great thanks for all, of, all that you've done. We've also had other folks that, have, that haven't uh, directly had a student um, sort of uh, been mentoring the student directly this summer, but have had a key role also. Um, so these are people that have taught classes, and many of the people in the previous slides have also taught classes to our program this summer. Um, these are folks that have taught classes or provided um, additional mentorship. Um, I think the students will recognize uh, Megan talked about um, clinical career pathways, and, and some of you uh, were able to do a tour of the OR and observe some cases. So hopefully that was a great experience too. The biggest thank goes to our trainees. You know, it's been wonderful to have you here this summer. Um, we thank you for being curious, for asking questions, for trying to make the most of your opportunities this summer. Every time out of the year, it probably should. Um, so thank you. We're really excited. I, I got a sneak peek yesterday of the presentations as we had a practice run through, and I think there's some really awesome presentations here today. So without much further ado, we will move on to research presentations. One last thank you to the Hillman Academy as a whole. This afternoon, you guys will get to hear from David Boone. He really runs this whole program across multiple sites. I've been responsible for just the activity of this small site, um, but these, these folks have really been key. And I should also mention uh, Madison Siever, who's our administrative support, who's also helped uh, get things organized, book our rooms for us, help with some of the technical challenges. Um, and another thank you to all of the students for helping pitch in with the lab move. We haven't had an academy before where halfway through we've said, actually, we're moving buildings. We need to pack everything up and move across town. So thank you for bearing with us during those times, which were um, some long days, some, uh, some days where you could. Oh, I just keep some meeting. Um, so thank you for pitching in and helping us and helping us get set up in our new home. So, so many thanks for that. So we can move on now to our first presenter, and our first presenter is Anissa, and she worked with Adrian Lee and Steffi Ushrai, and I think, is Neil here to introduce? Okay, Neil, if you would like to um, introduce, I'll try and pull the slides up and get it working again, maybe with some assistance. Oh, just time. Yeah. Okay. All right, so it's my pleasure. I'm Neil. Uh, I work in Adrian Lee and Steffi Osterich's lab. I had the pleasure of mentoring Anissa this summer. Um, Anissa was an absolute joy to have in the lab. Um, Anissa, I would describe very inquisitive, always wanting to learn more. She asked so many great questions. Um, it seemed like her favorite methods were Western blot and being at the bench and sort of doing the, um, you know, the pep learning the pipetting and learning what samples and learning sort of the target proteins. Um, Anissa is going to talk to you a little bit about our project in um, animal models of breast cancer, which I think is sort of an exciting new frontier for the lab as well. Um, Anissa is a senior, rising senior at Ellis, um, loves to play basketball and soccer. Oh my God, that's funny. My son's name is Brandon. Look at his head. Anyways, all right, so Anissa is also interested in medical school and aspiring young doctor, um, and perhaps maybe we planted the seed for a career in science as well. Maybe you can blend the two. So, um, yeah, thank you for all of your hard work. It's really been amazing to have you, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation.
So good morning, everyone. Um, as Neil said, I'm a rising senior at the Ellis School, and I work with Neil this summer in the Lee Ostrick Lab. And the title of my project is a characterization of estrogen receptor positive or ER positive tumors in rats. So after skin cancer, breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in women. Support for breast cancer awareness and the tons of work and money that goes into breast cancer research really have advanced our knowledge of how to detect, treat, and prevent this deadly disease. And although breast cancer um, mortality rates have decreased over the years, there's still a possibility that one out of eight women will be diagnosed with this disease in our lifetime. And so it is critical that we continue to do this amazing research and to take right of action to decrease the chance of diagnosis. So cancer is when uh, there's a mutation in the genes that cause cells to become abnormal. And breast, can breast cancer starts when these abnormal cells start to grow really quickly. And breast cancer tumor cells have these receptors that can bind to different hormones in our bodies. And so for this project, we're looking at estrogen receptor positive tumors. And so these tumor cells rely on the hormone estrogen to really grow and grow rapidly. And about 80% of all breast cancer cases are estrogen receptor positive. And so this is the most common type of breast cancer. In the lab, we use animal models and specifically rat models because they're somewhat similar to humans when it comes to genetics, anatomy, and physiology. And um, results in animal model studies can be interpreted and connected to human because um, of these multiple similarities. And so before joining the lab this summer, a uh, carcinogen-induced tumor model has been established. And that means that rats have been fed a cancer-causing substance. And as a result, they have produced tumors on their bodies. And we're trying to figure out what kind of tumors these are, because generating a replica of the most common type of breast cancer, which is ER positive, will be great to better study this type of cancer. And there comes some difficulty when trying to generate these ER positive animal models, because in order to cause cancer in them, we need to feed them or inject them with a really harsh carcinogen. And as a result, uh, these tumors can be really aggressive and fast growing. And most fast growing aggressive tumors are triple negative or HER2 positive, which are just different aggressive types of breast cancer. And so it's less likely that these animal models would be generating an ER positive tumor, which are less aggressive and more manageable. And so being able to generate these ER positive rat models will be very beneficial um, for future experiments. And so my hypothesis was that the carcinogen induced tumor models that have been generated show ER positivity. And so we used a number of different methods to confirm ER positivity in our rat tumor samples. We used a Western blot, an immunohistochemistry or IHC, and a QRT PCR. The Western blot and the IHC evaluate for ER expression, which is at the protein level, and the QRT PCR evaluates for ESR1, which is at the mRNA level. A Western blot is just a really common technique in the lab because it's really, really useful for detection of protein expression. Um, we get proteins from lysing or bursting our cells where the cell membrane breaks down and we're able to extract proteins and load them into a gel. And once the gel runs, this image uh, is produced at the top right here. And then we can transfer that image onto a fragile paper called a membrane. And we soak this membrane in an antibody solution, which allows for the proteins that we want and care about to be uh, presented on our image. So this is our first Western blot that we did. You see the gray mice in the middle are the different rats in their uh, se se separate uh, tumor samples. Um, and we know that the ER proteins are about 66 kilovoltons. And this is the rat butter on the left is like a, a ruler and it tells us like where our proteins uh, would be at. And so the Bands are right under the 70 mark, and so we can conclude that these are the uh, ER proteins being detected. And then the rectangle on the bottom just shows beta actin expression. Beta actin is basically loading control uh, used to its general expression across all cell types. Um, and we know we loaded our proteins with the same measurement and the same concentration. Therefore, beta actin bands should be similar across um, all the samples. And it just ensures that we have loaded our proteins at equal measurements. And so looking back up at the samples, uh, you see on the left, we have four controls. Controls are very important when doing any scientific experiment. It just makes sure that and verifies that what we say we're testing it is what we say it is. 
These are positive controls, which will be our testing. Um, we chose the uterus and the memory fat pad, which is the belly of the rat, which is directly correlated to the breast of a human. And these should show ER expression. And then our negative controls, which are the brain and the liver, um, the negative control shouldn't show what we are testing for. And these samples shouldn't have a lot of ER expression. And for Western blots, when a protein is present, the band will be there. And when the protein is not present, the band won't be there. And for our negative controls, you can see that there are really bold bands there, which, are, which make our Western blot a little less reliable than we would like. So we need to try to find a new negative control that will make our Western blot a little more reliable. So this is our second um, Western blot. And we tried, tried, tried to try to find a new negative control because it's kind of hard to try to find a true negative control because um, you can't really guarantee there's no ear expression in any mice or even human tissue. But we tried adding a confirmed ER negative human cell line. And you see that there's still a band at the ER protein um, like slot. So you need to take a step back and see what else we can do to try to make our Western blot reliable. And so we tried uh, changing the antibody solution that we bathed our membrane in, because sometimes the antibodies can bind to things they aren't supposed to. And this ended up working, as you can see, the negative controls don't have a band present and the positive controls do. And they're very faint just because we didn't load enough of the proteins into the gel. But even though they're faint, they're still present. And even that some of the samples show possible ER expression. And these are QRT PCR results. QRT PCR just basically quantifies the amount of ESR1 expression. And ESR1 is like directly correlated to ER. It's just another version of it, I guess. And we have three different graphs showing the different primers we use for the QRT PCR, but the results are pretty consistent um, with each graph. And you see in the samples 14, 10, and 21, they show ESR1 expression. And then these are our IHC images. IHC is when we stain our tumor samples. So we first go in with like a purple blue dye, and that stains the nuclei of our samples so they're visible to us. And then we go back in with a brown dye that uh, stains any ER protein in these nuclei. And so for our positive control, we use a uterus, and you see some brown dots which show that these nuclei have ER protein in it. And then for our negative control, we use a spleen sample, and you see no uh, brown dots, and they're all purple. And the like, yellow orange substance you see like on the top left. They're just uh, red blood cells because the spleen's main function is to store and filter blood cells. And so there will be a lot of red blood cells in this uh, sample image. And so these are our samples 10 and 14. Uh, you see a lot of brown dots um, for both 10 and 14. And this just shows that there's a lot of ER proteins in these nuclei. This is consistent with our QRT PCR results where you see that there is ESR1 expression in each of these samples. And then for the sample 21, you also see a lot of brown dots, which show that this can be an ER positive tumor as well. And then for sample 19, it's kind of hard to see, but all these dots are mostly, well, they're all purple dots. And so there's not a lot of ER protein or any ER protein in these nuclei. And you see that the staining is just like sitting there. It's called non-specific background. And so none of the nuclei have picked up the staining and therefore there's probably no ER protein in these nuclei. And so, this tumor is probably ER negative. And it's also consistent with our QRT PCR because you see there's no ESR1 expression for samples uh, 19. And so uh, our results are pretty consistent across our methods. I kept going back and forth between the QRT PCR and the IOC images just to show how consistent our results were. And we can conclude that samples 10, 14, and 21 um, can be classified as ER positive tumors. And so in the future, we can repeat the Western blot again because, again, I said that we didn't have enough of the protein to load into the gel, so the bands weren't as bold as we would want them to be. So we would repeat it just so that uh, the bands will be bolder and the Western blot will be as reliable as possible. And then we would turn these uh, proteins that have the ER, known ER positive tumor cells into organoids. And organoids are just like tissues on a patient just that mimic organs. And then we would plant these organoids back into new rats, knowing that these are ER, ER positive tumor cells and we can treat rats, experiment on them and test on them, knowing that um, 
they are ER positive tumors um, in them. And so this is the end of my presentation. I want to thank Neil Carlton for his mentorship and taking his time. Um, I know he's earning his PhD and in the progress. And I want to thank his time for um, guiding me through his project. Um, I also want to thank Ali, Dalla, Megan, Jay, and Olivia for being patient with me and helping me working um, with me and helping me with different lab techniques. And of course, I want to thank Steffi, Adrian, David, Stephen, and Solomon. Pretty fantastic. We have time for a couple of questions. If anyone has any questions, yes. I have a question about the, the model. Right. So this is giving a carcinogen to rats and it's generating tumors everywhere. Right. So is this then a model of? Are you considering this a model of like metastasis because it's not generated in specifically in breast tissue? Right? The, the cancer that you're trying to, to target. Yeah. So are you asking me, are these tumors considered? Like, yeah. Yeah. Will this be considered a model of metastasis and not a model, obviously, of breast cancer? Um, I would think so because some, I mean, most of the tumors were on the mammary fat pad, so most of them didn't spread and they were in that general area, so I don't think so. Yeah, I think it needs to try. We can always comment that the, the discarcinogen is known to lead to mammary tumor formation, and histology is confirmed by mammary tumors. So that's a great point. Any other questions for any so, Yeah. This was a really, really, really interesting <laughs> presentation. Congratulations. I'm really, really sorry. I would love to know what you like the most in the summer and what you would change. If you will do the same thing again, um, if you have the power to change, <laughs> um, I don't. I guess I think the Western blocks are really fun to do because they're pretty tedious, but there was a lot of lab, what lab work involved in it. Um, I guess generating more protein samples so that our last Western block could be um, present like better results. Great. So Isaiah is up next. Um, I'll try and get the right slides up just to you can start to compare. Uh, Lauren, are you going to give the intro? Up? Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren. I'm a master's student in the Leo Strike Lab. And I'm Olivia. I'm a postdoc in the Leo Strike Lab. Yes. And we had the great pleasure of working with the very bright and talented Isaiah Hooks. Um, Isaiah is a student at the Obama Academy, and this is his second time working with the Hillman Academy and the Leo Strike Lab. Um, working with Isaiah has truly been an amazing experience. He comes to lab every day ready to put his absolute best forward. Um, yeah, and so he's been working on a really exciting project trying to figure out the underlying mechanisms of uh, breast cancer metastasis. Um, he's mastered a lot of really cool techniques in the lab, so he's, um, he's really great at doing Western blots, and he really enjoys doing cell culture work in the tissue culture hood. Um, he comes every day very focused and determined. Um, he shows a lot of curiosity every day he comes into the lab, so we're really excited to see uh, where that takes him
Hello, everyone. My name is Isaiah Hooks, and I work in the Oscar Lab with my two mentors, Dr. Olivia McGinn and Lauren Brown. And the project I did over the summer is investigating mesothelial mesenchymal transition and in invasive globular cancer metastasis. There are two main types of breast cancer, including invasive ductal carcinoma and invasive globular carcinoma. First, we'll discuss invasive ductal carcinoma, or IDC. IDC is the most common type of breast cancer and accounts for about 80% of all breast cancer diagnoses. The distinctive feature of IDC cells is that they are contained in the milk ducts of the breast, but spread to other parts of the breast tissue. The IDC cells contain the ECAT heron protein, which is an important diagnostic marker of breast cancer and involved in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion or the ability for the cells to stick to each other. Each other. Next, we'll discuss invasive globular carcinoma. Next, we'll discuss invasive larval carcinoma. So, IOC accounts for approximately 10% of all breast cancers and is characterized by small non-cohesive cells that infiltrate the stroma in a single file-like pattern, which is shown on the image on the right. So the image also shows the distinctive pattern of the cells like in ECA heron. The cells are not as grouped together like in IDC, and the lack of ECA heron is the primary distinctive feature I will see. I will see displays a unique, unique pattern of metastasis where it mainly spreads to the ovaries like the meninges, GI organs, and the peritoneum. In addition to the same size as IDC, the IDC primarily spreads to the brain, liver, and lungs. Our project focuses on underlying the underlying mechanisms that contribute to this unique metastatic pattern of ILC, and can these patterns be targeted? To help understand these specific patterns of IDC and ILC, I studied a process called mesothelial to mesenchymal transition, also known as MMT. MMT is a dynamic cellular process that occurs during development, tissue repair, fibrosis, and metastasis. MMT is also known to promote ovarian cancer metastasis. During MMT, the mesothelial cells undergo a process in which they are converted into carcinoma-associated fibroblasts. So to track MMT and whether it is occurring, we measure levels of certain markers that indicate a mesothelial state or a mesenchymal state in the cells. So the mesothelial cells are indicated in green and the mesenchymal markers are indicated in pink. The markers that influence MMT are indicated in purple and the blockers that MMT are in, uh, indicated in yellow. The mesothelial cells also change morphology when they undergo undergo MMT. And we can measure levels of these markers in cells to see if MMT is occurring. And this is important because determining whether MMT is occurring can help us better understand and target treatment of breast cancer. So I also studied mesothelial cells this summer. Mesothelial cells are cells that line the body's cavities and the torn organs. The mesothelial cells have important functions, including transport, movement of fluid and particulate matter across cavities, leukocyte migration and response to inflammation, synthesis of cytokines, growth factors, and possibly tumor expansion. The main question I studied this summer is do ILC or IDC cells promote MMT? And our hypothesis is that ILC promotes MMT more than IDC cells. So to help us answer our main research question, we first looked at the ability of cancer cells to migrate towards mesothelial cells. So for our models, we used three, three IDC cell lines and three ILC cell lines. The ILC cell lines include MM1B4, MM330, and SOMF4. 
And the IBC cell lines include MCF7, t 47 b and TR751. And we also use a mesothelial cell line called ZT. We use a transfer chamber where we see the mesothelial cells at the bottom of the chamber and the breast cancer cells on top of the permeable membrane. Next, we incubated the breast cancer mesothelial cells for 24 hours. We then stained the cells that were able to cross the membrane in a purple dye and took pictures of the chambers. And the images showing darker purple standing indicated more migration. The wells that contained ZT media only served as control. After quantifying the images, we see that ILC shows more migration towards mesothelial cells. This is encouraging for our main hypothesis that LLC promotes metastasis via MMT due to the increased interactions between cancer cells and mesothelial cells. Next, we looked at how conditioned media from breast cancer cells affects mesothelial cells to see if they may be secret factors to induce MMT. The conditioned media is made from allowing breast cancer cells to grow and understand the media for 24 hours, then collecting the, collecting the media from the plates. We then incubated the ZT mesothelial cells with the conditioned media and then performed Western blot analysis to measure protein levels of the markers for MMT. And over here, these are the specific markers we chose, including three mesothelial and three mes mesochemo. We also took pictures of the cells to see if we could see any changes in morphology characteristics of MMT. Here are images of ZT cells in different condition media from ILC and IDC cells, as well as condition media from ZT cells were served as control. There were no major differences in morphology of the cells. So picture here are Western blot results. We found that e heron expression was increased by all breast cancer condition media. We found that alpha SMA was also increased by all breast cancer condition media. And the down here, the beta actin served as control to show equal and consistent loading of our samples into the wells. And there did not appear to be a major change in the R markers testing. But since we saw an increase in the mesothelial marker and the mesenchymal marker, whether MNT is occurring or not is inconclusive. So it does not appear that LLC or IEC differently affects MMT. So to conclude, it is unclear whether MMT occurs more with LLC or IEC cell lines. However, IOC cells shows more migration towards mesothelial cells. And MMT may not be the mechanism underlying the metastatic pattern ILC. The future directions include testing additional mesenchymal markers such as fibronectin. TGFB1 and trying different amounts of condition media or different time points. Here are my acknowledgments. I would like to thank my mentors, Dr. Olivia McGinn, Lauren Brown, Abdallah Wedden, and Allison Casey for being great and special teachers with me on this experiment. I will also thank the Lee Oscar Lab and the Hillman County for amazing students in lab. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. <laughs> I saw I have a question for you. Same thing. I may sound like a broken record, but first of all, fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. It was so great to have you there. Okay. And the second, the same question I asked you before. Maybe you can share what did you like the most and what would you change and look different if you were to come in next year. So your question is like, what's my favorite part? Yeah, yeah. Of the program in general, I think. Like it could be the experiment, could be the classes. Could you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, my favorite part was the experiment because I got to learn so much and of the breast cancer cells and what they do. And I learned so much uh, more new methods and how like, how the mesothelial cells act between um, IOC and IDC 
because they're like um because they're like um they're like um they're like very mastic so um we also did um western pots and stuff so those were also pretty fun to do because um they can show a process of what um the experiment is like showing um the process of going through um these um steps and the experiments Thank you. Awesome. Next presenter will be Olivia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa, and I am a graduate student in the Newman Lab. And this summer, we have the pleasure of having Olivia Zanesper in our lab to work on a project that focuses on PARP inhibitor resistance and triple negative breast cancer cells and what roles Nessence plays in that. So Olivia is a rising, rising junior at Beaver High School and in her free time she likes to work out and she likes volunteering at her local Humane Society Animal Shelter. And in the past six weeks since I've known Olivia, I know she has a great passion for science and she has a really open mind and is just ready to experience or learn a lot about different techniques coming from a background with no previous research experience. Olivia, I would say, is a real hard worker because not only does she come, she's coming in every day, she's coming taking classes, but she's also traveling from fever every day using public transportation, which really, and also juggling her summer homework and eating classes. So if that doesn't emphasize how much of a hard worker she is, I don't know as well. So after she finishes high school, she hopes to come to Pitt for undergrad and then afterwards to go to medical school to go into pediatrics. And with that being said, I'm excited for everyone else to listen to your presentation about your project. So. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Olivia St. Esprit. Um, I worked in Dr. Newman's lab with Lisa. And today, my project is going to be discussing investigating the relationship between senescence and PARP inhibitor resistance and triple negative breast cancer. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so what is breast cancer? Breast cancer is essentially the uncontrolled cell proliferation of the breast cells. So they're dividing at a much faster rate than a normal breast cell. Uh, breast cancer originates in the lobules or the ducts. And the causes of this are by a variety of risk factors, both genetic and just different things that would cause breast cancer. So breast cancer is the most common cancer for women. And with that, over 287,000 cases of breast cancer occur each year and 51,000 cases of non-invasive breast cancer. So with that, this results in over 43,000 total deaths. Um, what these numbers translate to is one in eight women in the United States developing breast cancer in her lifetime. So, my project focuses specifically on triple negative breast cancer, which is a subtype of breast cancer that's commonly abbreviated to TNBC. So triple negative breast cancer accounts for 15 to 20% of all breast cancers. And with that, up to 20% of them have um, a BRCA1 mutation. So triple negative breast cancer is more quickly growing and aggressive than other types of breast cancers. And it's also more likely to reoccur than other types of breast cancers. So the treatment options for this type of breast cancer would be surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation. And with that, this breast type of breast cancer is a little bit different than other types in its biomarker expression. So Triple negative breast cancer lacks three main biomarkers that you would normally see in breast cancer. So it lacks the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, 
and human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. So all of these allow for more targeted treatments to other types of breast cancers because they can target the specific receptor. But since triple negative breast cancer doesn't have these receptors present, you're not able to treat it with using those targets. So compared to other types of breast cancer, as you can see on the diagram, it has the worst prognosis rate, which means that it has the worst overall outcome for patients. It has many risk factors. The age is one risk factor. So unlike most types of breast cancer, uh, the age range for this is under the age of 50. And for another risk factor would be your weight. So if you're overweight or you're obese, you have a higher risk of breast cancer. And then your ethnicity. So if you're African American or Hispanic, you have a higher risk for triple negative breast cancer and your family history. So if someone in your family has breast cancer, then you have a higher risk for triple negative breast cancer. So PARP inhibitors are a very key point in my project. And so PARP is polyadenosine diphosphate ribose polymerase. And what this is, is an enzyme that aids in single-strand DNA break repair. So PARP inhibitors stop the DNA from repairing, which leads to um, cell death. So this is effective due to synthetic lethality. Now, we can only use PARP inhibitors in BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutated patients. Uh, some common PARP inhibitors that we use are talazoprib, oloparb, and niraparib. So as you can see on the diagram, in the top left corner, you can see that if you have both PARP and BRCA, you're able to repair your DNA. However, um, if you move towards the right, you can see that if you have BRCA, but if you don't have BRCA, so you have a BRCA mutation, but you still have PARP in function, you can still repair your DNA. Similarly, if you have a PARP inhibitor, which inhibits PARP, but you don't have a BRCA mutation, your DNA can still be repaired. The only way that the DNA cannot be repaired is if you have both a PARP inhibitor and BRCA mutation, because this will limit both the double-strand DNA repair and the single-strand DNA repair, and this will lead to cell death through synthetic lethality. So despite PARP inhibitors used in the clinic, the tumors can become resistant to PARP inhibitors. So over 40% of PARP inhibitors with, or of treatment patients treated with um, PARP inhibitors become resistant. So um, we can see resistance in prolonged oral control, um, oral administration of PARP inhibitors. So essentially there's a few different ways that the, um, that could lead to drug resistance. So there's the drug efflux pump, which essentially means that the drug goes into the cell and the cell spits it right back out. And there's also cell death inhibition, which is essentially something that stops the cells from being able to die. So therefore, PARP inhibitors can't kill the cell. And then restoration of the DNA repair pathways, which essentially means that if you have a BRCA mutation, you can no longer have that BRCA mutation, and so synthetic lethality can't occur. Um, another way that the drug resistance can occur is through senescence. So since DNA damage can induce senescence, um, therefore PARP inhibitors can induce senescence. So what is senescence? Senescence is a permanent cell growth arrest state. So we say permanent, but there is a little bit of controversy through the people who research senescence as to whether or not this is really considered permanent. However, for this project, we're going to consider it permanent. Um, but essentially, it just stops the cells from dividing, and it's induced by stress or aging. So you can see the two images of cells. The top one is a normal cell, and the bottom one is a senescent cell. The bottom one, you can see, is enlarged and flattened, and so it has a very different shape than a normal cell. And we can detect um, senescence through some protein, pa protein pathways like the P16 and the P21 proteins. So those two proteins contribute to cell cycle inhibition, which contributes to senescence. So senescence is sort of like a double-edged sword in a way. It's seen as a tumor suppressor and a tumor promoter. As a suppressor, it can be seen because it stops the cell from metastasizing. 
So if the tau can't, the cells can't divide anymore, then they can't spread throughout the body. So um, it suppresses the tumor in that way. But it's also seen as a promoter because of a complex secretory phenotype present in senescent cells, which is referred to as the senescence-associated secretory proteome, which aids in tumor growth. So my hypothesis is that if PARP inhibitor resistant or PARP inhibitor treated cells become resistant, then senescence is upregulated because DNA damage can induce senescence. So the methods that we used to test this were Western blotting and beta gal staining. So for both of these, what we did was we plated the cells one day and then we treated them another day and then we let them sit with the treatment and then we're able to analyze how this treatment affected the cells. So we did that for both experiments. For the Western blotting, this is essentially looking at the protein values in the cells by, like, it divides them by their size and their charge. So we can see if how much protein, like, certain proteins are in the cells. And there's also beta gal staining. So for that, that just stains the senescent cells blue so we can see them in imaging. And this um, is stained through the lysosomes of the cells. So these are the beta gal staining results. Um, this is for the MDA MB231 cell line. So on the left, you can see the parental cells. These cells um, are not resistant to any PARP inhibitors, but you can see that they were treated with different concentrations in different types of drugs. And you can see what the cells look like after being treated with the drugs compared to the control, which means that they weren't treated with any drugs. On the right side, you can see the resistant cell lines and different treatments or controls for those cells. So you can compare the two, and in that comparison, you'll find that there's not much of an increase in senescence between the two. So this can indicate that there was not an increase of senescence with PARP inhibitor treated uh, resistant treatment drugs. So you, there's more results from the MDA MB436 cell line. Uh, on the left, again, you can see the parental cells, which means that, again, they're not resistant to any drugs. And then on the left, you can see the talosopra of resistant drugs, and you can compare the treatments between the two um, and find that there's not an increase in senescence between these. So next, we did, so this, these are the Western blot results. And um, the way this is set up is these first three columns are the control, and then the cisplatin, halosoprop, and so on. So that's what the drug, that's what they were treated with. Um, down from there, you can see the cell line. So that tells you whether it's parental, ola resistant, or tala resistant. And so each column has the individual of whether it's resistant or not. So if we saw an increase in senescence, we would see brighter bands where it says ola and tala. But as you can see in this P16 protein, we don't see brighter bands next to Ola and Tala, but we see them rather with the parental cells. So that would indicate that there is not an increase in senescence. We also have this actin band, which is another type of protein that should be consistent through all of the cells. And this shows that we loaded the right amount of protein and like the same amount in all of our different wells. But you can see that there's two spots where the actin isn't present. This is just due to the toxicity of the two drugs that we used. And so it killed a lot of the cells and we weren't able to extract that much protein, but it's still um, significant data. So the P uh, P21 protein, we see a little bit of an opposite effect here. So the parentals have a lower concentrate uh, lower uh, protein expression than the OLA and TALA resistant. And even though we have these results, we still conclude that senescence is not upregulated with the treatment. So my results were that when PARP inhibitor treated drugs become resistant, there is not an upregulation of senescence. And the PARP inhibitor resistant MDA MB436 cell line shows upregulation of the P21 proteins. Um, for future, we could examine the DNA damage accumulation 
as an indication of senescence um, and PARP inhibitor treated cells. So we could look at immunofluorescence of gamma H2AX and 53DP1. And we could also me measure other um, senescence markers like the expression levels of LMNB1 and SAS pyrolysis and MRA expression. So I would like to give a huge thank you to Dr. Newman and Lisa for just teaching me everything that I know in lab. I came in with no research experience at all, and I was able to gain so much information this summer. I'd also like to thank Dennis and Yang and the WCR, so Jenny and Steffi, and of course, David Solomon, Stephen, and Madison. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Any questions for Olivia? Olivia, that, that was really, I mean, you learned so much. This was a very complex topic, and you presented a lot of time very fast. Really, congratulations also for such a fantastic job. Really, really very impressed. Thank you for being with us. That Thank was, you. It was wonderful to have you on that. Our next presentation is going to be from Denise Griffin. Hi, so my name is Sierra. I'm a postdoctoral associate in, um, in Nadine Hempel's lab. And Denise is going to talk to you guys today about a project that she's been working on with me that focuses on a protein that's very near and dear to my heart as I studied it during my graduate studies. Um, and I'll let her talk to you about that, but um, just to introduce Denise a little bit. Um, she just graduated this year from Allardyce High School. She's going to be going to CMU this year, um, and she's dual majoring in chemical and biomedical sciences. Um, Donise came, this, so this is Donise's second year in the Hellman Academy, um, but last year she did computational stuff, so this was her first year at the bench, and she's done a really wonderful job um, at transitioning to, uh, to wet work um, and wet bench work. She has excellent hands. She did all of this stuff by herself. She did a very wonderful job learning multiple techniques. Um, and it, we were just very lucky to have you with us this summer. So I'll let Donnie present her work to you guys. Yeah, keep leaving. The oh, no, I got it. I got it. I got it you got it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Donnie Griffin, and this summer I was had the pleasure of working in the Hempel Lab and looking at the RP1 splice variants of viability and survival in off car 433 cell lines. <laughs> so, a little overview on the cancer that I'm exploring I'm exploring ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is a type of cancer that begins in the female ovaries. The formation of the cells often go undetected until it spreads within the pelvis and abdominal area. Um, ovarian cancer often has no symptoms in the early stages, which is why it's often fatal and diagnosed later on. Uh, the symptoms that do arise can be nonspecific, such as um, appetite loss and weight gain. However, the more specific um, symptoms that are noticeable is fluid buildup in the abdominal cavity, also known as ascites, and mass formation. Okay. Um, surgery and chemotherapy are generally used together to treat and slow the progression of this cancer. Um, the two most common treatments are primary debulking surgery and neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by surgery. Um, ovarian cancer is regarded as one of the most lethal gynecological malignancies. Um, although not listed among the frequently occurring cancer types um, and, and incidences, it is most listed as having a very high mortality rate. Um, it is estimated that over 22,000 new cases will arise. Ovarian cancer has an estimated five year survival rate of less than 27% for patients with the advanced disease and 
this rare case, uh, this rare form of cancer is important to study uh, just because of how fatal it can be. Um, four out of five ovarian carcinoma patients are diagnosed in the late stages that have spread through advanced, diagnosed with advanced stages of cancer that has spread through the abdominal cavity. The cell line that I am culturing and growing in my experiments are off car 43s or ovarian cancer cell line 43s. Um, they are a type of epithelial tumor which begins in a thin layer of tissue that covers the outside of the ovaries. And 90% of all ovarian cancer uh, are epithelial tumor or epithelial cancers. Um, additionally, all CAR 43s are a type of high grade serous uh, ovarian carcinoma or HG OSCs. Um, high grade cirrhosis carcinoma, high grade ovarian serous carcinoma accounts for approximately 75% of all epithelial carcinoma. And for a little bit of background on the protein that I am looking at and exploring within my data is DRP1 or diamond-related protein 1. And from prior research, we know that tumor cell mitochondria are key players in a regulation of cell, cellular processes, including metabolism, signaling, stress response, and apoptosis resistance. Um, mitochondrial, mitochondria are integral in the regulation of energy, energy production and stress response pathways. And these are often hijacked by cancer cells. The maintenance of the mitochondria morphology by dynamic uh, diamond fission and fusion uh, events are essential in preserving mitochondria function and for proper distribution of the cells during mitosis. Um, mitochondria fission is also an integrate component in apoptosis and uh, autopet phagy pathways, fission and fusion deregulation is connected to a number of pathways, including uh, neurodegeneration and cancer. Uh, the variants that I'll be exploring and looking at are GFP, uh, which is a wild type of the cell line that has no missing exons inside of it. Uh, 16 and 17, DRP1, 16 and 17, which is just missing exon three. And then DRP, one, 17, which is missing both exon 3 and 16. By, by assessing ovarian cirrhosis uh, specimen data from the TCGA, uh, which I left them prior to me entering the lab, um, they, it was abundant that the full length DRP1 spike variant lacks exon. <laughs> um, it was known that the DRP1 variant uh, 17. Uh, has a lower progression rate uh, in uh, being able, in livelihood, sorry. Oh. My, my left hypothesis that I'm looking at is that the expression of distinct DRP1 splice variants is a novel mechanism to regulate mitochondria fission and function and integral to the ovarian cancer's plasticity during tumor progression. Um, and we're looking at this with the aim of investigating the role and interplay of ovarian cancer-specific DRP1 splice variants to determine how it influences mitochondria form and function. Uh, the first experiment I performed was a Western blot. Uh, the Western blot is a type of assay that's used in a lot of lab practices. Um, it is used to detect specific protein. It works by a gel, gel layer separating protein based on their molecular rate. And by adding in correct binding primary antibodies to the protein bands, uh, you, can, you, you can view the protein that you're looking for. Um, for this assay, I collected the cells from cell culture and performed a protein estimation to determine how much protein to load into the gel, um, which was followed by loading the proteins and conducting an electronic transfer and adding the antibodies, the RP1, and the secondary to um, have the protein show up on the membrane that we were using, and then finally washing and imaging. Here are the images from my Western blot. The loading ladders were added uh, to show where the protein lays. Uh, we use beta actin, which falls around the 42nd band. Um, and this is just generally used uh, because it has an even expression of, across all cell types, and therefore it's able to show loading consistency and that the proteins are there. Uh, and then next, we looked at DRP1, which we 
No lies around the 80th band marker. So we cut it there before adding in the antibody. And it is important to point out um, that this Western blot was performed in triplicates. Uh, so the data, the cell lines that we input it into the Western blots were collected at different times. And you can see that here P1 is in, expressed in all of the different cell lines that I look at, the period cell lines. The next assay that I performed uh, was a clonogenicity assay. And this assay assesses cell proliferation via colony growth. And you harvest your cells um, from the growing class and you seed them each into the six well plates. Uh, and then you just watch it grow over the next couple of days, 10-ish days. Uh, from there, you wash and fix the stains to the peachy dishes or the plates and let it dry and then stain with crystal violet to dye the colonies. And finally, you can wash it in ice water um, and then image them. Okay. And from the assay, here are my results. Uh, you can see that the well type not only has more but larger colony formation um, than the 17 uh, variant. The assay demonstrated decreased cell viability in variant 17 when compared to the controls. Uh, when compared to the controls. Um, this was like ex ex expected within our lab because of the prior research that stated that the five-year survival rate uh, for patients who had overexpression of DRP1 with the variant 17 uh, had lower survival rates. Um, the next assay that I performed with a, was a caspase glow assay. This is an assay that detects and quantifies uh, the events associated with program cell death. And specifically in this case, it's as, uh, caspase activation and caspase three and seven. Uh, this is a simple assay. You basically just mix the two substrate and buffer together, um, load it into your 96 well plate, and then add in your samples and then water. And then after you let it incubate for anywhere from 30 to three hours, you can image it. 30 minutes to three hours, you can image it. Um, for my results, of my caspase assay, you can see that there are quite large error bars uh, in these, and particularly the variant 17, uh, which can be because of the duplicate, the triplicate uh, collection. One of the cells can have just been more stressed out. Uh, the cell collection could have been more stressed out than the others, which would account for the increased cell death. Um, the overall takeaway from this analysis is that the caspase may indicate a slight increase in cell death via apoptosis in variant 17 compared to the wild type GFP and the variant 16, 17, although this may not be significant. Um, for future investigations, we can keep this process um, to just see if the results are conclusive over multiple uh, repetitions of the experiment. Um, therefore, the overall summary of my results is that DRP1 splice variants may the, the DRP1 splice variant 17 may differentially impact cell viability and survival, which can prove important in the context of drug response by ovarian cancer cells. Um, further exploration of this experiments that can be done and that are currently ongoing in the, the lab that I was a part of are uses of chemotherapy to examine the splice variant's individual effects on epithelial ovarian carcinoma cells, uh, stress response, and survival. Um, and this also can be explored in other cell lines or cell types. And finally, I would like to thank the entire Hempel Lab for helping me conduct my research this summer, my amazing mentor, uh, Sierra, additionally, Zainab, Amal, and Priscilla for helping me with my slides and my lab work with FinLab, um, the entire Hempel Academy, and Nadine. Thank you. Any questions for Denise? Denise, that was yeah. really fantastic. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. That's my story. What does it do for the enzyme that we You mentioned that this thing. Can you repeat that? Yes, that's my story. Describe it here if you want. What is the, how does it affect the protein function? Um, oh, how does it affect the protein function? I'm actually not 100% sure on that. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Long um, story short, we're not. Um, it um, seems to impact local relations in the Um, But overall, we don't really know. We're trying to assess that. But if you can assess it, we do a lot of things to slice where you do a Yeah. But localization it might impact a little bit. So it, it may impact its responsibility, but we don't really know. There's not much done on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I, I have a small question. So, <laughs> so uh, this is so many pieces to this puzzle, Denise. Um, I'm just trying, my breath is taken away. I'm trying to keep up. Why, can you say one more time, why you look at apoptosis? Um, for the... We're, we're looking at apoptosis for these uh, specific variants just because it's from like prior research. I think it's stated that uh, the overexpression, like the increase. Not necessarily. Yeah. But CRP1 regulation is my opinion in general, right? Yeah, the protein DRP1, the increase can just affect apoptosis. So we're just looking at it to assess the basically. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Joy will be our next presenter. All right. Um, so Joy was in my lab over the summer. She didn't work with me because I was sitting in my office writing grants, but she worked with a of a postdoc in my lab who, as you know, very much deserved a vacation. So I have the very important job of introducing Joy today. Um, so Joy is a rising senior at the Neighborhood Academy, uh, planning to uh, uh, apply to Penn and hoping to get on the big circuit at some point in the future. Uh, hopefully, your research um, has, has given you some more understanding of the basic science of which is really exciting. Um, I have to say that Aperva always had just wonderful things to say about Joy. She said it was a, a true uh, honor and pleasure to connect with her this summer. Joy learned a ton um, for seeing everyone else, uh, sort of all of the very basic uh, lab sort of things, right? The editing and all these really sort of typical things that we do. Um, Every day. She also became a true expert in immunofluorescence, which is some of the work she's going to show you here. Uh, and, and actually, really helped uh, her record of the project forward in, in some ways. So, with that, I will hand it over to Joy and, and just really want to yeah, re emphasize how much, how, what a pleasure it was to have. Good morning, my name is Joy. This summer I worked in Eret Lab and I worked on cyclone overexpression and high-grade serious ovarian carcinomas and how it increases DNA damage. Is it just anything? No, I keep forgetting to move the cursor back from the screen, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Okay. So ovarian cancer is the growth of cells in the ovaries, and these cells proliferate at a faster pace, meaning they grow and divide quickly, and they form tumors in the ovaries and can spread throughout the reproductive system. The American Cancer Society predicts that about more than 19,000 women will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and about more than 12,000 women will die from it. This is the number one cause of gynecological cancer fatality in women. So there are many histological subtypes of ovarian cancer, but the two that we discussed were low-grade serous carcinomas and high-grade serous carcinomas. These are cancerous epithelial tumors that form in the linings of the ovaries or the fallopian tubes, 
And low-grade serous ovarian carcinomas are caught earlier in progression, and they tend to be less fatal because they grow slower. Uh, then we have high-grade serous ovarian carcinomas, or HGSOCs, and these are type 2 tumors that grow at a faster pace and they spread. HGSOCs are often diagnosed in stage 3 or 4, and when they already spread outside of the ovaries and they're harder to control. These account for about 75% of ovarian cancer diagnosis. Okay, so cyclin E is a protein that binds to CDK2 in the cell cycle and the G1 to S phase. And the cyclin CDK complex are like little checkpoints that the cell has to go through in order to continue the cell cycle. And the checkpoint that we are discussing is the cyclin E CDK2 checkpoint. In this part of the cell cycle, this is where damaged DNA starts their repair process. So in order to do this, it has to choose a repair pathway. We looked at double-stranded breaks, and we focused on two repair pathways, but it's specifically homologous recombination. We saw that most cyclin high cells are HR-proficient, making these cyclin high tumors unresponsive to part therapies, which is a form of chemotherapy. And approximately 20% of HGSOCs have a high expression of cyclin E and are HR proficient, making these carcinomas unresponsible to PARP inhibitors. Okay, so for my hypothesis, I looked at if cyclin E overexpression causes DNA damage markers to increase. And the cell lines that I used for my project were FB282, which these cells are derived from fallopian tubes, and I used OFPAR8, which these cells are derived from ovaries. I also used fb 282 cc one which has a cyclin E overexpression, and this is a variant of the fb 282 regular cell line that we use. And then I use, also use the OFPAR8 cc one which also has a high expression of cyclin E, and these are a variant from the OFPAR8 regular cell line. For my methods, I've used an immunofluorescence assay, which I'll discuss uh, in further future slides. And then from this assay, the DNA damage markers that I was looking for was 53 BP1 and gamma H2AMs. And then the fluorocombs are attached to the parentheses, which I'll go with for are in the future slides. Here's just a Western blotting result showing that there was definitely a CC1 amplification in my CC1 high cell lines. Uh, vinculin is a loading gene, a loading control and housekeeping gene. And this uh, just shows that the amount of protein was equal in each of the loading samples. So you can see that there was definitely a thicker band, the CC1 high cell lines. So immunofluorescence is the detection uh, and expression and location of, sorry. Okay, the detection of expression and location of proteins in a cell using fluorescent tags, which are called fluorochromes, and these are detection agents used in cellular energy. They absorb the light at a specific wavelength, and they emit the wavelength through the device. So there are two types of detection uh, in this experiment, direct detection and indirect detection. We use indirect detection, but in direct detection is using only one primary antibody. And the downside of using this type of detection is that you can only detect one protein per experiment. So we use indirect detection, and this uses a primary and a secondary antibody, the primary being protein specific, and then the secondary holding the fluorocombs so that you can see the proteins through the microscope. There are four major steps to an IF procedure, cultivation, fixation, staining, and energy. So here's the protocol. Uh, we plated our cells in a 12 volt plate and then we fixed them. And fixing the cells just leaves uh, them at a study stage so that you can see them continuously throughout the project in the same state. And then we permeabilize the cells. This creates pores in the cell membrane. So uh, all the ages that you use throughout the project can penetrate the cell. Then we block the cells and this just blocks out all the proteins that you're not trying to target in your specific experiment. And then we incubate it with the primary antibodies. Like I said, this is protein specific. So this attaches to the proteins. And then it, it's very important to wash your cells with 1% trit X100 between the next two steps because this creates bigger pores in the cell and all the antibody that didn't bind to the proteins gets washed out leaving precision in the experiment. Uh, but next we incubate it with the secondary antibody and this must be done in the dark because the this holds the fluorochromes and the fluorochromes are light sensitive. So you don't want to pinch your signal before you're able to do your slides. 
And then we stand with Duffy, the stains the nucleus, so that you're able to see your cells on the slide. And after that, we mount and store our cover slips onto slides and store them in the slide box at negative 20 degrees until we're ready to count. Then we count it and record them. This consists of, uh, we did our project in triplicates. So there was usually three cover slips per slide. So on each cover slip, we counted 200 cells. And in that 200 cells, we counted the DNA damage markers that we were looking for, which is the gamma H2AX and the 53. Here are my results for my immunofluorescence assay. Uh, in the top line, so just uh, this row and that row over there at the top, and my regular cell lines, you can see that there is definitely less, a less amount of DNA damage pulsi, which are the lighter dots on the cell, uh, than there is in the CC any one high cell lines so in the second row. Uh, we left the, like when doing this, we left the cutoff. So to determine if it was a CC any one high cell, we left the cutoff at three full size. So if it had three or more full size, it was considered a CC any one cell one count. So yeah, you can definitely see there is an increase of DNA damage in CC any one high cell lines. And then I have the graphs at the bottom. And yeah, this just further solidifies the, and this is the amount of DNA damage cells in the counting of the cells. So you can see that there's definitely an increase in uh, DNA damage markers in CCD1 high cell lines. So I've concluded that DNA damage markers do in fact increase in cells that have a CCN1 amplification and future directions would just be the studies that are currently ongoing in the lab to outline the pathway by which cyclically high cells overcome the replication trends caused by cyclically overexpression and studies are being conducted to see how cyclically high cells can overcome HR proficiencies so that they respond better to heart inhibitors. So I'd like to thank Dr. Catherine Eric for being a mentor to me during my experience here. I'd also like to thank Apoorva, Naveen, and Richard. These are lab mates that helped tremendously with the progression of my project. I'd also like to thank other ARIT lab members. And then of course, I'd like to thank David, Stephen, Solomon, and the WCRC team and the Helmet Cancer Center Academy for making my experience here nothing but joy. Excellent. Any questions for Joy? Maybe I'll ask a quick question. Thank you. So you, I, I'm curious about the quantitation of your immunofluorescence. So how did you do that? Did you count like a certain number of cells in each way? How, how did you do that? So like I said, there are triple, we did uh, experiments in triplicates. So there were three cover slips per slide. And on each cover slip, we counted 200 cells. And then in that 200 cells, we counted the amount of DNA damage, full size that we saw. Okay, I see. Thank you. Great presentation. Beautiful project. What was the biggest challenge with the new sorts? Because Catherine and Julia think that they were things to learn. So yeah, uh, quenching the signal is definitely the biggest challenge. You can't leave that. There are lasers on the microscope. So I would have to change fields often. And counting is, it's, it's, it's tedious, very, very tedious. So, um, so I would count, I ran into the problem where I would count the, the amount of cells, so count 200 cells. And then after that, I would go to count the DNA damage markers and then I would push the signal and then I'd have to change fields on that cover slip. So I'd have to recount the 200 cells. So it's very challenging in order to manage the time well so that you can push the signal. Yes, it's a spot. Great, great job. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Very beautiful. And great pictures. Great, great lesson. So, thank you. Back anytime. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to count some more cells. That's great. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, our next presenter will be Sophie Adams. Don't know if. Hey, would you like to introduce? <laughs> Hello, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Sophie Adams, who was with us this summer. Um, she is a recent graduate from um, 
Well, she, this is her second time at the Hellman Academy. Um, she's a recent graduate from South Fayette High School, and she's going to attend the College of Brewster. Um, she hopes long term to go to medical school. Um, she's going to be double majoring in history and neuroscience. And um, she's going to discuss something that's completely different from all the basic science that you've heard here today. Um, in our lab, we look at uh, the um, symptom experience of women as they're going through breast cancer chemotherapy and look at racial differences in those experiences. And she's going to talk about a specific portion of that. So we very much enjoyed having you. And I'm um, just to hear your presentation. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Sophie Adams. Um, this summer, I worked in the Rosenwein lab at the School of Nursing, um, and my project was to analyze the impact of patient race on patient clinician interviews for women as they were assessed for breast cancer chemotherapy prior to their scheduled chemotherapy. Um, so some background, there is a persistent racial disparity in breast cancer survival. Um, although the percentage of survival has increased for breast cancer, um, the racial disparity um, remains. Uh, this is due to several reasons, um, including more aggressive types of breast cancer among black women, as well as um, larger tumor act diagnosis, which means they were diagnosed later. Um, so going back on previous work done in the Rosenwein lab, um, the research team found that 50%, uh, this was a study done on only Black women, so 50% had some dose reduction delay or early termination, 40% um, did not receive it, and 85% 85 85 of the women um, prescribed chemotherapy uh, were prescribed, I'm so sorry, were prescribed chemotherapy therapy um, were not prescribed chemotherapy in the um, time frame that is usually done. Um, so that study led to CMOR's lab, which is what I work in. Um, CMOR stands for the Symptom Experience Management and Outcomes of Cancer Therapy According to Race and Social Determinants of Health. Um, and we focused on the clinical encounter um, with system evidence of stress and management. So the specific aims of this project were to quantify the provider's interpersonal communication skills during medical interviews prior to cyclic chemotherapy for patients receiving early stage breast cancer chemotherapy and to compare those results by race. And the hypothesis of our lab was that there would be lower interpersonal communication demonstrated towards Black patients during psychotherapy visits as compared to white patients. Um, for the study, we need to look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, so the Seymour study recruited uh, females of the Black or white race, 18 years or older, who were prescribed chemotherapy therapy for a diagnosis of invasive breast cancer for stages one through three, meaning the cancer had not spread to other parts of the body, it was just breast. And um, we had to exclude patients who had prior chemotherapy, metastatic breast cancer, um, cognitive disabilities, the inability to understand English, and those who received treatment outside of the clinics that we had that were in Pittsburgh and Uh, so this study was this study was um, pers sorry <laughs> using my train of thought. This study was a pro-perspective comparative pilot study of coding in classical clinical interactions between patient and cancer provider prior to the chemotherapy, which is what I just said. And um, as I said before, uh, our oncology clinics were located in Cleveland and Pittsburgh. They were audio taped via recorders in the room with the patient's permission, of course. And then those interviews were later transcribed and analyzed by two reviewers using the four habits coding system, which I will explain in the next slide. And um, 
Any disagreements in the four habits coding system were then resolved using the consensus mechanism. So what is the four habits coding system? Um, it is four habits that uh, model patient and patient physician communication. The first being investing in the beginning and focus on establishing a rapport. The second is eliciting the patient's perspective. The third is measuring the level of empathy by the clinician. And the fourth is shared decision making between the physician and the patient. So habits were scored. Habits are scored on a 23 items on a one through five scale by the two reporters. In this study, however, um, as they were audio taped, only 22 items of the four habits coding system were used, as one of them was nonverbal behavior, so that cannot be assessed. And then these four mean scores were used to um, see the difference between the two races. So um, in these results, we had um, these are taken from 40 interviews out of 450 conducted. Um, these are the ideal racially matched ones. And something to look at is that for the Black demographic, um, you can see there was a higher percentage of people who had less income, um, did not have a college education, and were not married at the time. Um, and as these were only 40 interviews, um, these results, um, we expect them to vary um, as the study continues. Um, but the mean score for Black patients were lower for patients in the interviews for habits three and four, um, which are level of empathy and shared communication. The total habit scores for Black patients were lower, but not significantly so. Um, although, as you can see for um, habit two, eliciting patient perspective, the mean score for black patients versus white patients is significantly different, um, which is something we notice. Um, so our overall results is that the clinician interviews indicated by the patient's point of, sorry, um, we saw that um, there was a lack of patient perspective shown to the patient by the clinicians um, for black patients at, as compared to the white patients. And uh, a special thanks to the Rosenweig lab team for helping me this summer and walking me through this entire project. And a special thanks to the uh, Hillman Cancer Center and all of the people who work for it. Thank you. I think that was great, and that's really a really important topic. Are there any questions? Uh, my question about your 40 children, was it just like a random decision, or is it just like the boundary of your time frame? So those 40, um, they were um, racially matched, so those 40 were specifically chosen. It was not this random. Um, they also were exactly the same time frame in their chemo. Um, experience, and we thought that might be important, and they were getting the exact same price. So these were the most perfectly matched. So we will do the other interviews, they're all transcribed, um, but these were the, what we thought would be the price. Great job. I'm curious if you're also tracking the race and or gender of the positions. Um, I can imagine that might be about that. Um, I believe we are, and I do believe that that would have a great impact on the patient, especially since they're mostly women in this study. It fits for every person, every population. Yeah, we, uh, we have that. I, uh, it's not going to be primarily. Great, thank you again. So last but not least today, we have uh, Michelle 
like to introduce, I should apologize to Michelle because at the beginning I introduced and said this was our high school program. But Michelle is actually an undergraduate who's been with us and her stay this summer has been a little bit longer than the high school students. So um, sorry for not mentioning that sooner. We, we saved you till last. So you can round out some great presentations and looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nadia. I'm a postdoc and uh, the postman now. And we have like the uh, the first one, like to get like to work with Michelle this summer. She started like joining the lab like in June first, so we had like around eight weeks, like minus one week for the move. But like during this uh, seven and a half maybe weeks of like work with Michelle, she did like really great job. The first the one thing that I learned from Michelle was like she's really really quiet. And sometimes, like when I explain an experiment to her, she will like not respond, <laughs> not respond to me. So I will like <clears throat> think that like she did not get like the whole information. But when the next day, when she do like the experiment, she would do it like really perfectly. And as like at the graduate level, and then she was like really strong and really smart in doing that. And Michelle, she is like uh, rising the second year in case Western. University in Ohio, and she's like the recipient of Duke Doris, like uh, I think it's foundation for like her current her, like expense for like common sense work and doing like the summer program with us. So uh, during this time when Michelle like joined our lab, she's for her research was like answering an important question, like part of our project. And I'm not gonna talk about. Uh, her project and leave it like to be shared to talk about that. Hello, um, my name is Michelle Rieha, um, and today I'll be talking uh, about the work I've been doing this summer to determine their iron uptake enhances the growth of ovarian hair cell carcinoma. So a little bit of background on ovarian cancer first. So ovarian cancer is a type of cancer that begins in the ovaries. Um, and the outcomes for ovarian cancers are usually worse than other gynecological cancers. And epithelial ovarian cancer is the most common. And while there are many subtypes of ovarian cancer, high-grade serous carcinoma makes up around 70% of diagnosed ovarian cancers. And ovarian clear cell carcinoma accounts for approximately 5 to 10% of diagnosis, but it also has the lowest survival rate among all the subtypes. And so this summer, my uh, focus has been on ovarian clear cell carcinoma. Uh, which is a type 1 ovarian can cancer characterized by the presence of ARIN1A and P10 mutations. And ovarian clear cell is thought to arise from endometriosis. And the prognosis for patients with ovarian clear cell is worse due to being highly aggressive in chemo resistant cancer. So as I mentioned, we believe that ovarian clear cell likely arises from endometriosis, which is a chronic inflammatory condition that results in tissue growing outside the uterus and typically would line the inside. And it affects 10 to 25% of reproductive age women. So as you can see on the picture, you have tissue that's in the inside of the uterus, but you also in endometriosis, you also have it like on other parts outside of the uterus. So prior studies in our lab uh, have showed that CD10 negative endometriosis MSCs uh, play a specific role in supporting ovarian clear cell carcinoma. So in vitro and in vivo studies show that ovarian clear cell co-cultured with CD10 negative endometriosis MSCs uh, have a total uh, have a total more total number of cells compared to ovarian clear cell alone or ovarian clear cell co-culture with uh, CD10 positive and we just MSCs, which you can see on the graphs here as the ovarian clear cell with CD10 negative are the blue lines, which are 
Uh, than the other two lines. So, uh, a gene expression profile for C10 negative in the MSCs was ran and showed that it differed from C10 positive in the MSCs. So, a heat map was performed to look at the gene expression profile of high CD10 and low CD10. Um, and based on the RNA seq analysis, which is the middle picture, uh, we saw that there were iron exported genes upregulated in CD10 negative uh, endometriosis MSCs. Uh, and some of those genes are RRM2 and AKR1C2, which we believe are involved in uh, helping regulate iron uh, in this mechanism. So, uh, we believe that uh, low CD10 and the mutual MSCs is getting iron to a living clear cell. And to compensate for this, there was upregulation of those two genes uh, to prevent the cells from going into parapoptosis, which is iron dependent cell. So, CD10 negative and the mutual MSCs uh, demonstrate an increased amount of intracellular iron in a living clear cell person. So as you can see on the graph, the percent change of intracellular iron is higher uh, for the uh, tumor cells called culture with CD10 negative and reduces MSCs, which is the blue bar on the graph, compared to those co culture with CD10 positive or DC2 cells alone. And then the other graph shows a lip assay, uh, which uses specific staining uh, that depends on the amount of intercellular iron in the cell. So my research question this summer was whether iron uptake induced by ferric ammonium citrate treatment can enhance the growth of very clear cell carcinoma. So my hypothesis was that CD2 negative and endometriosis MSCs promote the growth of a very clear cell carcinoma through the regulation of iron in a way that cannot be replicated with iron treatment alone. So we're taking, for this, we took uh, low CD10 out of the equation. We're seeing that we can replicate this by at, uh, inducing iron uptake in the tumor cells. And we want to see uh, how this affects the gene expression of RRM2 and AKR1C2. So to measure the impact of the iron treatment on ovarian clear cell, TOV21G and ovarian clear cell carcinoma cell line was treated with different concentrations of ferric ammonium citrate to promote iron uptake. And the concentrations used were none for the control, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and 0 0.2 micromolars. And we used quantitative real-time PCR to look at the gene expression profile for ferritin L, which is the long-term iron storage, ferritin H, which is the short-term iron storage, RRM2, which is a projected gene against iron-dependent cell death, also known as ferropoptosis, and AKR1C2, which is another projected gene against iron-dependent death. So in Western block, we used to look at the protein levels of ferritin L, ferritin H, and the transferrin receptor. Uh, which is a protein responsible for allowing iron into the cells. So the results of my qPCR, uh, we can see in figure A and B that ferritin L and ferritin H, there was no significant change in the expression of these two genes with the increasing FAC treatment. And in figure C and D, uh, we can look at the changes in the mRNA expression of RRM2 AKR1C2, there was no significant change in the gene expression profiles of these two genes, either with the increasing FAC treatment, which uh, showed us that the cells cannot uh, handle the iron on their own. Um, and I repeated these results twice and got similar results for both. And then However, with the Western block, we saw in ferritin L and ferritin H are the middle two Western block photos. There was an increase 
of protein levels of ferritin L and ferritin H as the concentration of FAC treatment increased. Um, and there was a decrease in the, a slight decrease in the protein levels of the transferrin receptor FAC treatment uh, increase, which is the last Western blood photo. And the beta actin, which is used as our loading control, since the protein level should be relatively stable across all the treatments used in it. Uh, so what we can conclude from the data produced in the summer was that FAC treatment does not affect ferritin L and ferritin H gene expression, but it does enhance the protein level of ferritin L and ferritin H. I also found that the treatment with FAC decreases the protein level of the transferrin receptor, and that RRN2 and AKR1C2 do not change with FAC treatment. Uh, so FAC treatment uh, enhances uh, ovarian clear cell iron uptake, but ovarian clear cell cells uh, are not able to upregulate genes that are associated with iron regulation to compensate for it. Uh, on the other hand, previous work in the lab showed when ovarian clear cell carcinoma is co-culture with CD10 negative in the interest of MSCs, ferritin L increases uh, while ferritin H decreases, and ovarian clear cell personnel upregulates RRM2 and AKR1C2 to regulate the time within ovarian clear cell carcinoma cells. Uh, so this uh, many thanks uh, to Dr. Kaufman's lab and Huda for um, helping me learn this summer, uh, and for David, Solomon, and Stephen, and the Maggie Women's Research Institute, uh, and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation for any of my experiences. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Questions from Michelle? question about uh, CD10 negative MSC. So I'm a bit naive when it comes to different markers of the cell. So what, is CD10 a marker or something specific or is it used to, to some particular type of stem cell? I think it was stromal. Stromal. Okay, so you, I guess you're thinking that the MSCs have some kind of role over and above helping the cell use iron, given that when you gave FAC, you didn't see the changes that you saw in MAS. That makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, this concludes the, the talks from our students this summer. I think I'll just reiterate what I said at the beginning. This, um, you know, there's a lot of people involved in making this program happen. Happen. So thank you again to the physical investigators and hosting students in their lab, to the uh, mentors who worked um, each day with our students and of course the students are bringing in enthusiasm um, to the lab this summer and we hope you really enjoyed the experience. Um, I think there's some more afternoon programming from the main um, program and some certificates and graduation things going on so I hope you will stay around for that. Um, and we have a lunch I think should have just been set up just outside these doors so we'll welcome to grab some lunch and come back in and socialize before the afternoon activities. Uh, start. So again, thank you to everyone. I should also thank, of course, the friends and family and supporters of the students here today for, for making them uh, be able to participate in the program, helping with transport, helping with organization and stuff, and of course being here today to see the um, presentations. Definitely would like to say something to you. No, Jenny, thanks <laughs> to you for wanting it. <laughs> And also, Jenny, I wonder what they want to take a picture of this for us. Yeah, I think that would be great. We can have the scholars come up, we'll take a quick picture, um, and then from, just feel free to please help yourself to the lunch that we have just left outside. Now, let's take a quick picture.